Cheers. Hi, and welcome to Cherry Talks Movies. And today, there's two new things. First off, I'm wearing my ass hat, Australian Research and Space Exploration hat. And secondly, new camera. I've got a Sony ZV-1 Mark II, which is an upgrade from the previous camera I had. It has a not wider lens. It's um, really crisp looking. I think it does a better picture than the old one. So upgrade was worth it. So let's talk about science fiction because it is again Science Fiction Saturday. This time around I have a couple of movies that were filmed in 1959 but not released until the 1960s because they weren't very good. But there's a few subtexts in both of them that make it kind of interesting. So let's get started. We'll start with the lesser of the two for me, which is a movie called The Atomic Brain. It was called The Atomic Brain when it was released on television, but the original title when it was released theatrically was Monstrosity, which is a very broad title. I like the Atomic Brain much better as a title. This one is weird. Like the second movie I'm going to talk about, it's about body transplants of an extreme type. And it came from the same box set as the other movie I'm going to talk about, The Brain That Wouldn't Die. And it ca I picked up this one dead cheap on Amazon. It's called The Brains That Wouldn't Die Collection which has the atomic brain, the head, the brain that wouldn't die, indestructible man, the amazing transparent man, and the master. So they're all public domain movies. Don't buy this. The quality of the movies on this are singularly bad. And my light just went. That's better. As I said, don't buy this. You will regret it. The quality is crap. But I managed to find better public domain copies of both of these movies, and I watched them don't know what I'm going to do with that. I think I may give it to a charity store. But anyway, back on track. This girl was buried in a nearby cemetery yesterday. Only a few hours ago, her body was stolen. By Dr. Otto Frank. And brought to this hidden laboratory. He has grafted a living animal's brain into this newly dead body. The Atomic Brain is a weird film and it's got some really interesting twists and turns. Basically, it's a story of an old woman called Mrs. March, played by Marjorie Eaton, who has her own place in science fiction cinema history. She was a person who physically portrayed em Emperor Palpatine in the original release of The Empire Strikes Back before it all got redone. Her voice was dubbed, but she was the physical person doing that. She was also in uh, another movie I've talked about on the channel, Night Tide, the Dennis Hopper Mermaid movie from the early 1960s. And she was the old ornithologist in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. It's really interesting because she's portrayed as an old, decrepit woman in the atomic brain. In a wheelchair, kind of nasty, old, uh, debilitated. And I looked it up. I, I thought, let's do some research on this. She was the same age when she made this movie as Sandra Bullock and Famke Janssen are now. Times change enormously as far as female actors are concerned. And Marjorie Eaton does a nice job playing a bitter, rich old woman called Mrs. March, who has a atomic laboratory in her basement, basically, run by a guy called Otto Frank, by, played by Frank Gerstel. Frank being, of course, a Frankenstein analogy, who's doing experiments with a nuclear reactor and transplantation because, yeah, they're exactly the same kind of thing, really. So, Dr. Frank's doing these experiments. He's created a man beast by transplanting a dog's brain into a what looks like a wrestler's body. It's probably bad to put a dog's brain into a man's body because that's how you get men's rights activists. But he does that. He also creates a woman zombie who wanders around the lab to gets rid of her because she's of no use to him. The whole idea of having all of this laboratory stuff in the basement is Mrs. March wants her brain transplanted into the body of a young and beautiful woman because she's rich and she can have what she wants as long as she can find a scientist to do it for her. So she hires some domestic help, a woman called Nina from Austria, a woman called B from England who has it for some reason has a southern accent, and a woman called Anita from Mexico. So these are the three women she's got as kind of test subjects to see which one she wants to have her brain put into. I want them examined immediately. Very well. This way. 
Anita gets rejected because she's got a birthmark on her back because who wants to be in a young, beautiful body with a birthmark? So she gives Anita to Dr. Frank, who puts a cat's brain into her body. Anita starts doing things like eating mice and climbing around the top of buildings and hissing and spitting and clawing at people and all those kind of things. I'm not too sure what her toilet arrangements are, but you could probably extrapolate from the obvious things to think that there's an enormous litter tray somewhere in the house. Nina finds Anita on the roof of the house, and unfortunately, Anita falls off the house and dies. Not before she does some damage to Mrs. Marsh's pr chosen body, which is the body of B, the, the beautiful, tall, blonde woman. Unfortunately, Anita, when she's got the cat brain in her, claws one of B's eyeballs out. Dr. Frank manages to preserve the eyeball and says he's going to be able to, to re-implant it into B's body. But meanwhile, Nina has other ideas. She doesn't want any of this stuff to go down. And she's the default choice for Mrs. March's transplant. This, again, gets weird. I'm going to spoil this movie for you. I'll be honest with you. I'm going to spoil this movie for you because the ending is where it gets really cool. Both Nina and Mrs. March are on operating tables in the laboratory. But Nina has cut a deal with Dr. Frank because Mrs. March has arranged for, should Mrs. March die for all of her money to be left to Nina, who of course will be Mrs. Marsh, her brain in Nina's body. But Nina's cut a deal with Dr. Frank and other things are done. So Nina gets away and Dr. Frank transplants the brain of Mrs. March into the body of her cat. Problem is, Mrs. March in the body of the cat. I'm not sure how they fit a human brain into a cat's head because cats got brains the size of walnuts and we don't. This movie is not scientifically accurate to one tiny amount, but I like the idea of a vindictive older lady being in the body of a cat. And as Nina escapes, everything kind of blows up in the lab and all that kind of stuff. Mrs. March in the body of the cat starts to follow, and the movie ends there. Mrs. March did not intend to let her money get out of sight. She would follow that girl. Sometime, someplace, revenge would come. That's when it gets interesting. It'd be really interesting to see the ways a vindictive old lady in a cat body tries to get her revenge on a woman who has stolen her fortune. But we don't get that in this movie, which is a real shame because that's where the movie should start. That's the really interesting part. But this movie doesn't go there. Now, it's an incredibly cheap movie. And you can tell it's incredibly cheap because all of the dialogue is post-dubbed. They didn't have the facilities to do live recording of dialogue while the movie was being made. And so everybody speaks a little bit slowly so that it's easier for them to do the ADR in post. There are also lots of gaps in the plot which are covered by a voiceover. And voiceovers in this kind of movie are kind of the same way they were in Ed Wood movies, where you get tons of voiceover. In this case, the voiceover is done by an uncredited Bradford Dillman, which is kind of cool because it's a very familiar voice, and then you don't figure out who it is until halfway through the movie. And it's Bradford Dillman, who at the time was doing some good career stuff. He was making Compulsion with Orson Welles and Dean Stockwell at the time. And so he also does... This totally shitty voiceover role to earn a few extra bucks, of course, until the, the movie Compulsion comes out. Do I recommend Monstrosity? Yeah, it, it's a perfect creature feature kind of movie because low production values, a little bit of titillation where there's some not quite nudity in there. So it's got that kind of 1950, late 1950s edgy sleaze about it. It's got an absurd premise there, but it's got that beautiful ending where a woman who has suddenly come into a great deal of money is being stalked by a black cat. And I like that. I like the way that's done. I like the way the movie leaves that as a cliffhanger. It's a satisfying ending because it leaves you with something to speculate about after this movie ends. And for a movie this kind of low rent, low stakes and low budget, it's great to have that kind of little bit of meat on the bone at the end of the movie to just wonder about. And somebody should write that story because I like the idea of it, and I think that it's the best thing in the whole movie, apart from a woman eating a mouse. So that's the first of the two movies. Monstrosity, also known as The Atomic Brain, which is much better than the version of it I got in here. The movie doesn't deserve to be treated like this. That then takes us to the second one, which is a lot of fun, The Brain That Wouldn't Die, which should not be called The Brain That Wouldn't Die. It should be called 
the decapitated woman who is not allowed to die because her fiance is a total prick. This one runs 82 minutes. It's in the public domain because they totally stuffed up the copyright notice when the movie was made. Directed by Joseph Green, it stars Jason Evers under the name of Herb Evers. Jason Evers had a bit of a career in television in the 1960s. And as the decapitated lady, you've got Virginia Leith, an interesting actress, who at one stage was dating Jeffrey Hunter, and another stage was dating Marlon Brando in the 1950s. So she had a bit of a film career. She stopped for a while when she got married and, and went back to have a, a film career further. But based on this film alone, she was a fine actress. She could really bring across what this movie needed. And she is the most valuable player in this movie because she gives real pathos and real energy while sitting with most of her body hidden under a table. Her brain kept alive by experimental science, by a man whose abnormal passions inspired him to try the impossible. I brought her back. She'll live and I'll get her another body. Yes, and what of her soul? How can you make of her an experiment of horror? I'm going to tell you what the movie is about, and then I'm going to tell you why I think it's something a little bit different and a little bit special. First off, there's Dr. Bill Cortner, played by... Jason Evers, I won't use Herb Evers, I'll just call him what he was known for for most of his career, who is a surgeon, whose father is a surgeon. Bill does an operation on a patient who's been pronounced dead and brings him back to life, but his father doesn't like his methods. He's kind of not going through the normal processes of having certain technologies and certain d treatments tested properly before use on human patients. So his father's pissed off with him. Bill and his beautiful fiancée, Jane Compton, played by Virginia Leaf. Oh, every time you touch me, I go out of my mind. Are driving to the country home where he has a secret lab in the basement again with a guy called Carl, who is a surgeon who um, has a really bad transplant by Bill. So he's got like a really unged up arm. And of course, disability is in these movies is always associated with some kind of deviance. So Bill's driving like a nutcase in one of those great big 1950s American cars on the country road to the house. He pranks the car, it flips over, and his fiance Jan, her body is decapitated and burned, and he manages to rescue her head and carry it to the lab where he and Carl hook it up to a whole bunch of tubes and wires and basically keeps her head alive because he loves her. So he says... <laughs> Let me die. Let me die. But of course, Jan isn't happy about this. She's experiencing agony. She's in. There's no pain management in any of this. Wants to die because basically she has died and has been preserved because of the ego and the wishes of her fiance. And there's a euthanasia subthread in this, which is kind of interesting as well. She asks Bill to let her die, and he says no. What he does instead is he starts prowling around looking for a body to transplant her head onto. And he does that by, you know, going around and, and cruising the streets and, and meeting a woman he used to date before he was engaged to Jan. And she directs him to a strip club where there are all these beautiful women. And we see some strip club performances. And there's a conversation he has with the strippers in the back room because he, he kind of goes to the back room with the strippers where they say the most beautiful woman they know, the most beautiful body they know is this other woman that they all went to school with who is now working as a life model for a bunch of sleazy photographic amateurs where she basically takes her clothes off and they take photos of her and she pay the money now i'm not going to shame anybody for being a stripper or being a borderline sex worker work is work bill is just basically shopping for a body that he wants to put jan's head on he eventually meets the figure model his name is doris played by adele lamont who does a pretty nice job with a minor role she actually delivers the character really well and Doris has a bit of a backstory. She was dating somebody when she was in college and that guy slashed her face. So she's a life model, but she has a hair over her face and she has a quite a prominent scar on her cheek. Bill then starts that thing about, I can fix you. I've, I'm a surgeon now. I can repair your face. I can do all that kind of thing. The kind of stuff you see in Eyes Without a Face and also uh, Circus of Horrors with um, Donald Pleasance and Anton Differing in it. Disfigured women surgeon promises to repair this stuff bill decides he's going to take doris back to the house drug her and decapitate her and pop jan's head onto her body because he's got a serum that makes transplants okie dokie meanwhile in the basement jan 
finds out she's got telepathic powers. And there's something in a hidden dungeon in the lab, which is basically Frankenstein together from body parts, a, a kind of large monster with whom she starts building rapport. She talks to it and it responds to her and she promises they will both be free. So she finds her own power after she's decapitated, which is really interesting. And she realizes what a toxic asshole Bill is, as if being decapitated and brought back to life isn't enough of evidence. She finds her own strength and finds her own purpose with this disability, which is kind of interesting. She communicates with this monster who eventually breaks out of the chamber it's in, rips Carl's arm off, which is great, just as Bill comes home and drugs Doris and takes her down to the lab so that he can do the head swap. This does not end well for Bill. It doesn't end well for Jan either, and she is very much the victim here. So Jan orders the monster to take Doris out and out of the house and away. So the monster and Doris both survive. Meanwhile, the monster has accidentally set fire to the lab. Bill's killed, and Jan burns with the lab. Now, this movie's got such a strong subtext in a modern context that is incredibly powerful in the way it, it tells its story. Basically, Bill Cortner is the poster boy for toxic masculinity in science fiction cinema. I did a little bit of an experiment by asking my friends on Facebook who they thought was the most toxic misogynistic man in science fiction movies. I'm just going to see what I've got here. I've got a couple of responses, but I think I may get some more. So I'll just bring them up on the screen you can't see. My friend Lee Battersby said that it was the character Chris Pratt played in Passengers, which is a good one. That character is the one that spoiled the whole movie. Um, I won't do a video about Passengers because it's not worth doing, but um, another person, Robert Griffith, says, Michael Moriarty in Q. Now, I don't mind Jimmy in Q. I, th I think he's a, he's a damaged character. He's got PTSD, clearly. But I don't think he's misogynistic and toxic. I think he's just... Yeah, a damaged little street scum who actually finds his best self. So I disagree with that one. Robert also says Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange. Alex Delage, yeah, I can see that. He's toxic. He's not a good person at all. He's a street scum. Uh, Ian Nichols says James Bond in Moonraker. Yeah, I can see his point there. Roger Moore in Moonraker. He also says Baron Vladimir Harkonnen in June the 1984 version. I think it's Kenneth McMillan who plays him in that. Not sure he's particularly misogynistic. I think he's fetishizes disease and things like that, but I don't think he's misogynistic particularly. So I've got a few different opinions on there, but for me it's Bill Cortner, who is a toxic masculinity. First off, we know he's a player because he actually dated a number of the women he talks to while he's body shopping for a body to put Jan's head on. Secondly, the whole idea of killing someone so you can get your decapitated girlfriend's head onto another body is messed up in 17 different ways. And there's also a clock ticking, apparently about 48 hours after he puts Jan's head on the table, she's going to die because of complications. Yeah, um, for me, Bill Cortner, I know also that, that body shopping thing and, and kind of sleazily looking at these women's bodies, evaluating how they're going to look with Virginia Lee's head on them is something deeply egregious. It is monstrously bad. It's something I do not like at all. And he's the sort of character who, were he living in a modern age, will be defending Andrew Tate and listening to podcasts by Jordan Peterson. He's that kind of men's rights wanker. Kind of, we know the type of character he is in a modern context. And for me, that, that's really interesting. Finding parallels between modern situations and older films is, for me, interesting. I did that with Uptide in the last video I did, comparing the way that uh, the disenfranchisement of people of colour is compared to in 1960s and, and the modern day. And that toxic masculinity that you see in Bill Cortner is something that feels contemporary as well because those problems haven't gone away. It makes the movie much more interesting than it would be otherwise. In fact, there was a remake of the film done in 2020. I haven't been able to find a copy of it. And I don't know whether it was good or bad, but it was shown at a film festival or two. And it'll be interesting to see just how that movie would be reinterpreted in the modern era. Because I think it's... Uh, and also there have been a couple of musical adaptations of it as well. Because nothing says musical more than a decapitated woman and a guy looking at strippers. 
Having said all that, I think the the brain that wouldn't die is an important science fiction film because it does exactly what's required of a movie of that time. It's got a little bit of titillation. It's got a bit of horror. It's got a weird concept. It's got an iconic image. But more than that, for modern audiences, it has something to say about the relations between men and women and women finding their own power through adversity. So you've got the atomic brain. You've got the brain that wouldn't die. You've got a box set that you shouldn't buy under any circumstances. There are better versions, particularly of the brain that wouldn't die, out there. And you should definitely buy those rather than buying this. So that's it for this time around. Hope you enjoyed the video. It's a couple of retro things that I found interesting for very different reasons. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. I'm doing a live stream, which for American people will be on Sunday, but for me will be on Monday morning at 7am. I'll put the times up on the community tab on the YouTube channel page. So until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some really freaky science fiction movies from the 1950s slash 1960s, which actually talk to some contemporary things. And I'll catch you next time.